Good morning to everyone here. It's the day of the Lord, very special, the day of resurrection when God's people used to gather as a church to worship. So in this brief time I have before me, I would share something that has come very dear, personal to my heart, which I've been pursuing for many years now. I'm speaking on the centrality of God with specific emphasis to the pursuit of God. which is the ultimate exercise of a man of God. The Bible is not just truth put after one after another, or it's not statement of doctrines. We find truth stated, but explain to the lives of people. Bible is a book of biography containing the story of many people who have lived through history, unlike many other Religious books, it doesn't contain legends, myths, stories that has been constituted through imagination. Bible is a story of living people who have radiated and lived the truth. So the very purpose of truth is to live it, to radiate it, to make it real in our lives so that the redemption that has come to us become true and real. Our faith doesn't mean that we believe these 10 things. Our faith means these are the things I have believed which has been working in my spirit which I have lived through life, and this is a result of faith. The true evidence of faith is the life of a people who live it, not the people who profess it. So Bible is a beautiful collection of stories of great men who have lived through the centuries. So, I am just highlighting a particular person out of, the, out of those stories, the story of Moses. Not an entire, but certain anecdotes out of Moses' life and trying to bring, as I told earlier, the most solemn pursuit of life intended in the life of a disciple. As you see, the book of Exodus, in the beginning, as it's as the ch first chapter, we find the hapless, the extreme misery of the people of God in Egypt. And then, in chapter 2, we find the birth of Moses, the miraculous preservation of Moses in the midst of the king's decree that all male child born should die. God's way of preserving Moses in a very miraculous way and how it turns to be so 
amazing that Moses had the opportunity to be groomed by his mother at the same time to grow as a son of Pharaoh's daughter. And then we find the miracle life of Moses that he virtually lived as Pharaoh's grandson, rose up to power, if you can believe the para history, if it's not full history, but there are evidences through history, Moses rose to great eminence in Egypt. He led so many expeditions of Pharaoh. I don't want to go into detail, but from Hebrews itself as we read, he came to a very enviable position in those days. But in the same chapter, at the end we find all that happened to him, the great miracle we were speaking of, ended with a tragedy, apparently. He had to run away from Egypt. All he had gained in Egypt had to be abandoned. He fled for his life. And then in chapter 3, when we find him, we find Moses not in the height of his glory. We find him at the depth of a great gloom. A man in despair, a man whose future is so bleak, nothing to look forward in life, aimless, almost like a wanderer. The man who grew in the king's palace is now tending the sheep of Jethro the priest of Midian. A very gloomy, desperate, bleak picture of life. When there is nothing to look forward in life, when life is bleak and without meaning, then all what we do is just a repetition. Life is a routine. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, every day is the same. That's what Moses has been doing. Every day, taking the sheep out and going for the pasturing. And that day, Moses went, chose a certain direction, and took the flock even up to Mount Horeb. For man, when life is without aim, when he finds it is lost, that's as he looks at it. There is one who knows the ways, the life, the purpose, the intentions of every heart. It's very important, always know, that is one who knows me, my heart, my intentions, my life, everything. One of our greatest safety is to be so assured that there is somebody who knows. Surprisingly, Moses sees a stunning sight. There's fire. Fire means it should spread and consume everything. What should be less left is just ashes. But that's not happening. The fire is intensely burning. But the bush doesn't get consumed. Moses just turns aside to see what is marvelous side. And as he turns, to go near, he hears a sound. His name. 
Moses. Moses. Very personal. In this wilderness, who knows him? Who cares for him? Who knows his name? I don't know, even in Jethro's house, he was called by Moses, perhaps called by a nickname of a shepherd or so. I don't know. But here, a very personal call comes. Moses turns the immediate sound that comes is don't come near. And then he hears don't come near. Take the sandals out of your feet. The place you are is a holy place. The first sense of God Moses receives is of the solemnity, of the reverence of God. God, not a doctrine, not just gathering and having a program. Nice time together is much more. God, the most reverential presence. That sense of reverence should never depart from our hearts. I find Gentiles, heathens, Many Episcopalians, Catholics, many such people appear to be more reverential. At least when they come to a church or a temple. But often we believers, charismatics, Pentecostals, evangelicals, they have become so familiar with the things of God that we have lost our reverence. God should mean primarily reverence to our hearts. Amen. God. And then God says, take away the sandals. Where you stand is a holy place. The second thing about God that comes to Moses' sense is that God is holy. God has to do with holiness. I don't know what we are understanding about God. Praise the Lord for good times, for worship times, for singing times, for thanking times, for ministry of God's word. Everything. And sometimes we boast as the more scriptural believers, the full gospel believers. People say we have all the seven fundamental doctrines. Then somebody comes up, they say, no, it's not seven. We have nine. And there are other people come, no, it's not even nine. We have 12. God is not in seven or nine or 12. God is there where there is reverence for his name. God is there where he is counted holy, acclaimed holy, and people separate their lives to a holy God. This holiness comes from a word hegios in Greek, which means consecrated. It's not about doing this or not doing that or wearing this or not wearing that. It's not primary in those, day, in those things. It is all about the consecration, the separatedness of my life to God. And then 
Moses gets that personal call. Moses, Moses. He gets that sense of God. God is not that distant. God of illusion and notion. He's a personal God who comes near. Who is interested in my life. Who has plans and purposes for my life. Who wants to hold my hand. Work with me. Who loves, desires fellowship with me. He's a very personal God. Not that distant God, but a very personal God who has purposes for my life. That's the next thing that comes, who can change my destiny by walking with him. The man without purpose, the man without answers, the man with questions, is immediately assured. God, who is so personal, who knows me my name, who has plans and purposes for my life, who can change the destiny of my life. God should mean not the program, the teaching, the doctrines, the structure of the church. If these are important, only these are important in terms of God, in knowing God, in understanding God, in walking with God. If God is absent, everything is weakened. I want you to know when God is not meaningful in your life. God central, not central to your life. Everything is meaningless. Remember, God is not religious as we think. God is not religious. See, we think religion is to do with Buddhism, Jainism, Islam, Hinduism. You know Christian religiosity? There is something called Christian religiosity. Religion is everywhere. We can't skip it. When God is absent, the next thing is religion. This way we do, this is what we believe, this is the way we, we act. These are the ten things of speciality. This is the separation, this is the way we keep our separation. The one thing to escape from religion is God. The centrality of God in our life. When Moses finds God, when Moses finds God, I said he is in such a low condition of life. So one of the amazing things we we'll see in life is most often people meet God or God meets people in their laws of life. Why? We often have the question, why a good God allows pain and suffering? Moses definitely had questions. Lord, I did it all with good intentions. Even the position I had, I didn't use it for myself. I wanted to redeem the people, God's people. That's what my mother taught me. When I was in my mother's lap, when she told stories to my forefathers, and even in the prosperity of the kingdom, I birthed in my heart that there should be a redemption for my people. I birthed these dreams, but why it all happened? Why? God allows pain and suffering. I tell you, I ask you a question. What was your best time with God? What was your best time of spirituality? When you trusted God? 
when you prayed God, when you worshiped God, when you obeyed God, when you trusted, what was your best time? Look back. Or what are your best times? Is it times of prosperity? Or is, is it times of suffering? When things go well, when things prosper, when we are successful, we little need God. Only in suffering, in weakness, in pain, we tend to draw to God. That is how Moses had the vision. Many of us met God. I often wonder. I find a lot of people in Kerala. I never felt that they will ever find God. That is the way they live. Their attitude. Their philosophy of life. Everything. Appeared never they will meet God. Many of them later in life into Gulf. Then I find once they come on a holiday, it's not the it's not the previous people. They changed. What happened? They say, I go to church. We have a good time there. They come with a change. I wonder how people go to Gulf and come with a change. I found the secret. They go there. Their work is very toilsome. There's nobody to protect them. Anytime their boss can just dismiss them. Not even one day's notice, they can just say, no more work from tomorrow. Everything is in suspense. Life is absolutely uncertain. Very insecure. That's the time God met with them. Don't get offended with me. I don't see the same with people who come to US. Here is a land of plenty. I know you have struggles and problems, but you have a lot of avenues to tide over. No need of starving. If you lose one job, within a reasonable time, you'll get something else. You are in the most prosperous country in the whole world. Life is more secure here. Therefore, God is not a must. Church is more for social relation than spiritual advancement. That is why there is less revival and more problems in American churches. I don't say it is here. Please don't get me wrong. I ask you again, what was your best time with the Lord? I remember what Spurgeon has said. God's gifts, God's love letters come in dark envelopes. The blessed Showers come from the darkest, fiercest, thunderous clouds. Amen. I don't know if you have thanked God for the times of suffering and struggle. I've done, done it so much, so much, so much. Because my greatest learning came through suffering. Ministry of the word is good, fellowship is good, church is good, study is good, everything is study. Everything is good, but there are certain things you can study only and only and only through suffering. Suffering is a great teacher when you, when you learn to relate with God. Your learning is very unique there. Praise the Lord. Thank God for sufferings he allowed in our lives. That God had greater purposes in our lives. 
I exhort you, dear brethren, whenever there is suffering, don't get frustrated and call everyone to pray and somehow get rid of it. But be still. Wait before God. And listen what is God's way through it. There's a wonderful book title called Don't Waste Your Sorrows. Suffering is a great mind. There's so much of treasure, divine treasure is hidden there. So, amen. I myself had my greatest lessons to suffering. Yes. Look, go through history, the men of history, the great suffering they went through, but the great products they became through all that. That is the very same with the biblical characters too. When you suffer, go to the biblical characters and see if they ever suffered. It was all a life of suffering, struggle, conflicts. But God made wonderful men through these crucibles of suffering. Now, very important to see that my time is running out. Very important to see that. See, it all started with the burning bush. Then he turned aside and heard God speaking to him. Now it was all God. God speaking. God giving meaning to my life. God becoming a fresh assurance for my life. A new destination, a new hope for my life. Then what is the whole purpose of the burning bush? It's only an alert. Burning bush is just a means. The end is God. Burning bush is just a means, an alert to God. And that is not an end in itself. That's a great tragedy of Christendom, especially the charismatic and Pentecostal Christendom. Once there is a burning bush, it's tremendous uproar around the burning bush. Now it's all about the burning bush. Somebody has a healing and the rest of life an advocate of healing. A witness of healing. Somebody had an experience. Rest of time. An advocate of heavenly experiences. Somebody in a dream. Or in a certain way went to heaven. Now there is book on their heavenliness. Book on what they saw. And from stage to stage. They are witnessing. Somebody recently told you should hear. Two hours of testimony. What's the good about all two hours of testimony. If God is not at the center. If it is all about burning bush, you have better stories in this world. I often wonder, is this the man who went to heaven? From heaven down and finally, is this a person? If you had an experience, if it doesn't turn an experience with God, what's the use of all that? We miss God and we are just around the burning bush. Therefore, Christendom is so with a lot of specialization, believism, faith theology, believe, believe, believe. Doctrinism. This is a correct doctrine. That's not this. A pre-tribulation is the right thing, not the post-tribulation. No, 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 it's a post-tribulation. This is the way we conduct. This is this is the way. We are so letter Christians. Becoming so legalistic or pharisaical. We miss God. Our subject is gone. Wrong. Legalism, Phariseeism, superstition. It goes and goes. Dogmatism. Sorry. I wish our heart turned up to God and our cry and prayer and song. Nearer, my God, to thee. Nearer to thee. A reverential heart to God. 
a holy consecration before God, a personal relation with God. There was a wonderful man in Canada later who came to New York, the founder of Christian Missionary Alliance, A.B. Simpson. He had a wonderful healing from a cardiac problem a century back, even more. He had a tremendous experience. He gave it became a great missionary around the world. But later when he, he wrote many hymns, one of the hymns says, then it was healing I sought. Now I seek the healer. It was blessing then. It is the Lord now. It was power then. It is a mighty one now. It was a gift then. It is the giver now. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Dear church, may God at the center of your life. May God bless you.